Well, good evening and uh, welcome everyone, both here in person uh, and online. My name is Richard Holden. I'm president of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia, uh, and we're here to host with the University of Sydney this year's Keith Hancock Lecture. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet. Uh, here, it's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, as I say, tonight we're here for the Academy of Social Sciences' Keith Hancock Lecture. Uh, and, and Keith Hancock himself, who, who I will refer to in just a second, wanted to be here this evening, but I believe will be joining us online. Uh, it's named in honour of, of Keith Hancock, uh, who's an emeritus professor and uh, Order of Australia. He's been a fellow of our Academy since 1968. Uh, and was Academy President from 1981 to 1984. He's one of the two Australians who are honorary uh, fellows of the London School of Economics. And this lecture was inaugurated in 2009. Each year it's delivered by a distinguished social scientist. This year, I'm thrilled that we have Professor Deborah Cobb Clark uh, as that distinguished social scientist. And I think Deborah lives up to the true term social scientist. Um, I, I like to say sometimes there are people like me who are economists and then there are economists who are actually social scientists in the better and broader sense of the term and I think Deborah fits that category. I hope you'll uh, excuse me for reading part of this because Deborah's um, biography and accomplishments uh, are too hard for someone like me to commit to memory. Um, she's Professor of Economics at the University of Sydney, of course, Deputy Director of the ARC Centre of Excellence for Children and Families over the Life Course, Program Coordinator for the Gender and Families Research Network at the Institute of Labour Economics in Bonn, Germany, uh, an elected fellow of our Academy, the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia, a distinguished fellow of the Economic Society in Australia. Prior to joining the University of Sydney, she was the Ronald Henderson Professor and Director of the Melbourne Institute for Applied Economics and Social Research at the University of Melbourne. For over 20 years, she's worked with Australian government departments to provide evidence-based solutions to social and economic disadvantage issues around welfare reform. She pioneered the Youth in Focus project that powerfully linked survey data of youths and their parents with government administrative data to investigate how young people achieve economic and social independence. Deborah will be talking this evening about some new work very much in that spirit. We're delighted to have her. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Cobb Clark. So oh, thank you very much for that very generous um, introduction, Richard. And I'd like to also welcome all of you who are here. And I'm aware that there are people um, joining us online. Um, I had the pleasure of first meeting Keith Hancock when I was a very junior academic at ANU in the mid 90s. Um, I had recently arrived from um, the US and I was on a very steep learning curve. And maybe, maybe just to give you a sense of that learning curve, I'll just tell you my story. Um, so I'm standing in normal Illinois, surrounded by four children, which is already pretty interesting. And in those days, um, everything was, you know, all business was conducted by mail. So one day a contract arrives in the mail from ANU and it says, you know, we'd like to offer you this visiting position, please sign the contract. Um, when you're ready to make your travel arrangements, call up Juanis and tell them and you will pay. And I said to my husband, oh, what kind of a country is this anyway? Does everybody know everybody or something? Um, no way this is actually going to work. And the first of those things actually is true, right? If you've spent any time in Canberra, you know that everybody does know everybody. Um, the second of those things turned out to be false. It did work. That was exactly how business was done. Um, you know, periodically, Qantas would send an invoice to ANU, and, and you would just pay it, and it was all very civilized. So Keith was one of the first people that I met, and he was part of a, a chorus of people who were telling me, with a certain amount of pride, I might say, um, that, you know, Australia is different. Australia is not like U.S. And I'd already started to work out some of that. Since that time, my research agenda has largely been around one question. What can we do to prevent poor children from growing up to be poor adults? That's it. That's my other pitch right there. That's it. Um, 
in the beginning, when I arrived, we were largely thinking about that question through the lens of what we knew about the US. There wasn't a lot of Australian data and Australians really didn't know very much about themselves. Since that time, you know, the, the sort of data that we've had access to and the, the sorts of um, research that we've been able to do with those data have given us a much richer understanding, a much more nuanced understanding of what it is that's leading to intergenerational disadvantage um, in Australia. So what I thought I would do tonight is just weave a bit of a story about, you know, disadvantage, inequality, economic opportunity, and what we sort of now understand about the things that lead poor, about why poor children actually grow up to be poor adults. Um, so I thought maybe just to, to kind of motivate a little bit, This is where the technology fails me. Let me just see if, can I, can I do it manually? Nope. Oh. It doesn't seem to be advancing here either. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Okay. All right, so I just want to start with this um, quite long quote from Barack Obama. I'm not going to read it to you. I'll just paraphrase. Basically, what he says is, you know, it's been a disaster in Washington. None of us have done a particularly good job. Everybody's really frustrated with us. Um, but what we need to understand that the frustrations that the American people have are not just due to these sort of political um, debates and gymnastics that are happening. Really, the source of their frustration is the frustration that comes um, through their daily lives. They are struggling to make ends meet, to pay for the kids' college, to buy a home, save for retirement. And they have a nagging sense that no matter how hard they work, the deck is stacked against them. Their kids are not going to be better off than they were. And they may not follow the back and forth of the politics that goes on in Washington, but what's really motivating them is this frustration that they are experiencing in a very personal way, the relentless decades-long uh, trend that is this growing inequality. And the lack of upward mobility has therefore jeopardized this middle-class American bargain that if you work hard, you're actually going to get a chance to get ahead. And he called this out as what um, as the defining challenge of our times. My, my view is that if you really want to understand the U.S., you don't need to understand the extremes. What you need to do is you need to understand the middle. And you need to understand that a lot of people feel this way. And if you're sitting in the middle of that distribution and you're really quite worried about what's, what your position is going to be and, and what's going to happen for your children, that that's motivating a lot of the turmoil that we're seeing. Um, Barack Obama wasn't the only one who pointed to this. The OECD has said much the same. They've drawn a link between sort of, you know, perceptions that there is strong upward mobility and life satisfaction and well-being, and a sense that there isn't um, that same sort of mobility is tends to be associated with um, under has a tendency to undermine the democratic process and also the kind of social contract that we have. So I want to start by thinking a little bit about inequality. And, and I know that we have a lot of conversations about the fact that inequality is growing. But what I don't think we talk about quite as much is that the nature of it is changing. So sometime around 1980, that graph begins to trend. The red part is the um, inequality that exists within any country. And the bottom part is the inequality that exists between countries. And this is just total inequality. So inequality might be going up, but 
the proportion of it that's being driven by inequalities between countries has been going down. And much more inequality now is being driven um, within societies. The OECD estimates that it actually takes children in low-income families somewhere between four and five generations to reach their country's average income level. So that's a, a fairly long process. If you think that you're somehow gonna be moving people to some sort of um, middle position. Rising inequality is important for my part of the story because it really pulls the rungs of that social and economic ladder apart. It makes it much harder for people to move up the ladder. It makes economic and social mobility just much more difficult because the, the distance that you have to travel is much larger. And then there's COVID. So there's plenty of bad news, right? We're, we're worried about the COVID generation, those who are under the age of 50, 25, um, facing declining social mobility because of the rising um, economic and educational inequalities that would have come out of all of the disruption and school closures and the way that universities have pivoted to online education. Poor children in particular are more vulnerable to economic health and learning support shocks associated with the pandemic. And the, the, you could go on, right? This is just kind of uh, to set the stage a bit. At the same time, I think there's probably some good news and we shouldn't kind of forget that. So this, the um, chief investigators in the Life Course Center set ourselves a task at the end of last year to actually write uh, a position paper on what the opportunities were in COVID to reduce social and economic inequality. What opportunities have COVID presented us with? And there's actually quite a number of them, right? Telehealth is opening up access to certain kinds of health for certain people. Working from home is opening up certain labor markets to people who wouldn't have had access in the past. Uh, the government's spending a lot of money. Presumably, some of that money could be spent in ways that would build infrastructure, housing, for example, um, that would uh, reduce social and economic disadvantage. Greater recognition of the role of caring professions. And I would argue broad support for the social safety net, right? Australians got to see the safety net in action in that terrible week in March of 2020, when suddenly unemployment lines looked like we were experiencing the Great Depression. The safety net worked, and people who had no reason to expect to be in that unemployment line suddenly found themselves being supported. This is an opportunity to do things that we might have thought were pretty hard a couple of years ago. It's not gonna just happen, right? Some of things will kind of occur sort of naturally, but a lot of it's gonna take um, some pretty thoughtful design of the way that we do public policy. And, you know, moving away from some of the things that we've been taking for granted. So I wanna um, focus tonight on the Youth in Focus project. Uh, I want to tell you a bit about the story because the, the results that I'm going to be talking about tonight or the research that I'm going to be talking about tonight comes from this project. So in the 1990s, there were two public servants at the what was then the Department of Faxia, Families, Housing, Community Services, and Indigenous Affairs. It's now DSS. Those public servants um, worked out that if you use the government's administrative data, the Centrelink data, the payments data, that you could link young people who were receiving payments to the payments that their parents had received. So for the first time, rather than looking at the social safety net as you know, individual uh, payments for individuals who were on and off, there was an attempt to put the different programs together and to understand the experiences within families across generations. And what that work did is for the first time, that is the first time that we were able to confirm what we've always suspected, which is that there is in fact an intergenerational correlation in um, income support in Australia. 
So that led to the Youth in Focus project, which had as its objective um, trying to study the consequences of growing up in a family with a history of income support, but more importantly, trying to understand the mechanisms. How is it that disadvantage is getting passed from one generation to the next in these, um, in these families? The project was supported by a linkage grant from the Australian Research Council. Um, and I will note for those of you who are thinking about research council grants at the moment, yes, it was true. This was a five-year grant because in those days you could get five-year grants. Um, we no longer can do that. Um, it was in partnership with Faxia as the industry partner, and then we had support from Centerlink. And it was a, a very major project, right? We had a substantial amount of resources that were being contributed through um, the Australian Research Council funding, but also through, um, through the Commonwealth government. And we had a, a large research team. Um, since then, the data that I'm gonna talk to you about have been used by numerous research um, policymakers, PhD students, um, I didn't do an exact count, but we think probably close to two dozen publications have resulted from that. And, and I just want to note that the research from tonight's lecture was done jointly with Melissa Babanyas here as well. Okay, so what did the project look like? Well, we started with the government's administrative data. It has this, you know, unfortunate name. They named it before we got to the table. Um, it's called the transgenerational data set. Um, it basically covers 97% of young people who were born in this six month window. And we we're able to kind of work that out because we have census data that tells us how many kids were born. Um, at, you know, the safety net's very generous, very uh, comprehensive for families with young children. So you're in this data set, not necessarily because your parents received welfare or income support, but also because at some point somebody got a childcare payment for you, or they got a family tax benefit for you. Then those data provide us with detailed um, fortnightly social assistance payments from start of 1996 to 2014 is what we currently are working with. And we can link um, young people to their families. What we did as part of this project was in 2006, now not quite 20 years ago, we ran a survey. So we drew a sample of individuals that were in the administrative data, and we got Roy Morgan to um, conduct phone interviews with a sample of the youth who were at that time turning 18, and a parent, typically their mother, who was asked a bunch of questions to kind of fill in the, the background information. Um, the interviews give us a lot of contextual information. So the problem, the administrative data are great, but the problem is that you don't know very much about people, right? You don't know education with any regularity. You're not necessarily, you might know income, but you're not necessarily gonna know what type of job they've got. You certainly don't know things about mental health or how they feel about social benefits or you know, what their family relationships are like. So what we wanted to do was conduct a survey, a comprehensive survey to ask all kinds of contextual information. And we wanted to talk to mothers on the grounds that we thought they would be able to fill in for us background information about what happened to children while they were growing up. We asked a, a permission question to do the linking and 96% of young people asked, agreed that the survey information that we were collecting could be matched to the administrative data. So when I talk about income support, I don't necessarily mean all transfer payments, right? So the Department of Social Services makes all kinds of transfer payments, including old age pensions and um, childcare payments and certain family tax benefits. Um, uh, the youth allowance, which university students get, right? We tend to pull that out. And 
The payments that we're going to focus on as being income support are the health payments that go to people who are disabled, either for physical or mental disability, or because you're caring for someone who has a health issue, right? Um, the payments to go to parents, low-income parents, either partnered or single, and then unemployment payments, either New Start allowance for adults or youth allowance, job seeker for um, youth. We're going to focus on the income support payments that went to the primary carers of the young people that I care about. Um, between the period of 1996 and 2002. So the thing to remember is these are payments that the primary care for this child was getting while that child was between the ages of eight and 15. We then look to see what sort of income payments, income support payments these young people are receiving between 2011 and 2015 when they themselves are now 23 to 26. And the reason that we've kind of picked that is we think, well, you know, that's about the time that people's education has finished and they're starting to enter the labor market, starting to step into adult roles. And the survey information we have is for 2006. So I've got everything about the family payments while you were growing up. We interview you at age 18, and then we look to see what your income support payments look like when you yourself are in that early, early to mid 20s. So let me, just to give you a sense of what the data are telling us, right, I'm gonna show you a graph. What's on the y-axis here is the percent of young people who have entered income support. Okay, so one of those payments that I talked about. And I'm gonna put young people into one of three family categories. The first is the red category. So your family, while you were growing up, had very intensive income support. Second category is they had some income support, but not as much. And then the bottom category is the black category. There's no evidence that your family was ever on income support while you were between the ages of eight and 15. Okay? And across the bottom, the x-axis here is just time. So in 2003 to 2004, the kids are turning 16. They then turn 18. They're then 21. And by the time we get to the end of my data period, they're turning 26. Okay? And that's what it looks like. So young people, by and large, are not entitled to income support before the age of 16, unless it's exceptional circumstances. But at age 16, they're allowed to apply for income support in their own right. And you see a big spike as they do that while they complete high school, presumably. And then there's a dip down as they perhaps move into higher education or they enter the labor market. And then it kind of levels off. These are the kids whose families received only a moderate amount of income support. And these are the kids whose families had no income support history. So it is, you know, about one in 10 of these kids who grow up in a family without income support will in fact use the income support system when they um, enter their 20s. But the gap between a, a kid growing up in a family with no family history and a kid growing up in a family with intensive income support is about fourfold. And that is one way of thinking about the intergenerational correlation, okay? The patterns are remarkably similar. The, the big spike up you see just after they're turning 21 is the global financial crisis. And you can see that, you know, everybody, you know, there was just a sharp increase there and then it kind of levels off. But these patterns, the trajectories are not so dissimilar for these kids, but the intensity or the level of need for the income support system is quite different. Between the ages of 23 and 26, if you just look at, you know, kids whose parents never got income support, about one in five will be getting income support themselves, and they'll get something around $3,000. Um, 
But for the kids whose parents did receive income support while they were growing up, that number is almost double. And the amount of money they're getting is more than double. Okay. This ratio, about 1.9, 1.9 times as likely to be on income support if your family access the income support record, it is actually um, pretty consistent with what you would see in the Netherlands. It's less than the correlation you would see in the US, um, somewhat less than what you would see in Sweden. And you know the dollar amounts kind of make sense as well. So this places Australia pretty squarely in the international context, not as bad as the US, um, you know, perhaps not as good as some of the, the Nordic or Scandinavian countries, but the, the ballpark is about the same. The other point that I wanna make is that this um, intergenerational correlation in income support exists for all the payments. So this is um, the first set of bars here is the, the, um, the proportion of kids who are on any income support. The dark red or the brown color is for those kids and families whose parents didn't access income support. The orange is for the kids who are in families who, whose parents did. Those are the health payments. The same gap between kids who have a family history of income support and don't are just about the same. That's the parenting payments, and this is the unemployment payment. So the takeaway message is that this overall correlation in income support across generations is actually being driven by these intergenerational correlations in all payments. Okay, so what do we think the, the pathway is? Why is it that we're observing this sort of intergenerational correlation in income support? So Jim Heckman's view is that it's about what happens in families in early childhood, right? He argues that 50% of the variability or the differences in people's lifetime earnings, right? Lifetime earnings um, across people is due to the characteristics that they themselves have at age 18. That by the time 18, half of the variability that we would see in lifetime earnings is already accounted for. And that any, um, you know, investigation of conditions in early childhood is a study of how families matter, right? So it's happening early and it's happening in families. And money can't fix everything. There isn't a lot of support that untargeted, but just blanket income transfers uh, to poor families is gonna significantly boost child outcomes. Now, if you think about it, that makes this problem kind of challenging for government, right? Governments are pretty good at taxing and transferring, but if it's not about money or regulation or providing for the common defense, these things become pretty hard. So what we were able to do with these data that we collected, these survey data from talking to 18-year-olds themselves, is we were able to think about where were they starting this transition into adulthood? How were, how were things different for them if they were growing up in a welfare family versus a family that had not accessed welfare? And these are some of the outcomes that we tracked, right? Things to the right are circumstances in which disadvantaged Australians at age 18 are more likely to have dropped out of school, um, to think that government benefits are too low, to be a smoker, um, to live independently of their parents, to believe that the government should be looking after unemployed people rather than families themselves, to have experienced a depression or a pregnancy, to say that their health limits their work, to be obese, okay? On the left-hand side are the things that they're less like. 
they're less likely to be employed. They're less likely to obtain an ATAR and they're less likely to be receiving financial support from their parents, okay? The bottom set of graphs tells exactly the same story and they're on, because they're on separate scales, one's on percentage points, one's on standard deviations, I've graphed them separately, but you get the same picture, right? Delinquency and drug use are more common, having an internal locus of control, um, physically exercising regularly, having good relationships with your parents are all less likely. Okay. So what we want to do now is to think about how those things matter for young people um, going forward. One of the points I want to make here is that in a, re in a relative sense, some of these things are actually really very large. So Welfare kids are three times as likely to experience pregnancy. They are nearly twice as likely to drop out of high school or to be a smoker. Others of these differences are less important. Um, the ATAR gap is actually about four points. So what we did is we essentially divided the relationship between parents and kids' income support into two group, into two pathways. One is a direct effect, and one is an indirect effect that operates through, um, through the outcome at age 18. Okay, the overall is the sum of the two pathways, and what we're trying to do is understand whether these things we measured at 18 that I just showed you are in fact responsible or a likely pathway for the uh, intergenerational correlation in income support. And here's what we found. These graphs are the proportion of the overall correlation that is due to that outcome that we measured at 18. These are the education outcomes. If you stack the risky behaviors, right, you get, uh, you get about 20%. Parenting accounts for somewhat smaller, and then a bunch of things that may be significant, but are probably not important. So the takeaway message from this is that about 22% of that overall correlation is operating through the failure to complete high school. Those welfare kids are just much less likely and that's driving or accounting for a lot of the intergenerational correlation. Okay. Risk taking also matters, right? Um, and untangling those two things is, is pretty complicated. Um, what drives that failure to complete high school? It's early school experiences, lots of disruptions. So uh, school changes, re residential changes, suspension, expulsion. Once kids complete year 12, there's actually surprisingly little impact of the family having grown up on welfare. So if you can get them to year 12, you get them to complete, you don't see much, right? But for those kids who drop out, there continues to be an impact of a family history of welfare. And it, it's largely because the kids in welfare families who are dropping out are dropping out for the wrong reasons in a sense, right? They have financial problems, poor behavior. Somebody told them they should go. They're not making progress. Kids in, in more advantaged families tend to report that they're leaving because they have a job, because they have an apprenticeship, because whatever they've chosen to do with their life does not require them to complete high school, okay? And there's very little coming through these attitudes. Yes, young people growing up on income support have different views of the income support system, but that's not explaining why they end up on income support themselves. So what do we do now? Well, the first thing to note here is that it's a pretty complicated problem. Um, the capacity of kids to make a successful transition into adulthood is driven by all kinds of things, not just financial resources, but experience and influence and expectation. And there are some strategies, right? This is from the OECD. What governments need to do is eliminate system level policies that hinder equity and target low-performing disadvantaged schools. 
So with that in mind, what I want to do is just turn to a couple of options to consider, right? This is not a full menu. There's going to be plenty of other examples of things that we might consider trying. Um, but I think that the, the two things that I'm, I'm going to draw your attention to are well within reach. And the first is behavior management in schools. So the international evidence, there's some um, quasi-experimental kind of causal evidence that suggests suspensions are pretty bad. Suspensions and expulsions for disorderly behavior um, tend to reduce test scores and re reduce graduation rates and increase criminality. Now, in Australia, we don't have this kind of quasi-experimental causal kinds of evidence. What we have is a lot of correlations. And what we know is that students and families who receive intensive income support are four times as likely, four times as likely to uh, be suspended. They're two and a half times as likely to repeat a grade. 40% of expulsions, or sorry, suspensions involve students with disabilities. Indigenous students are more likely to be um, sent home. Ross Hommel gave this, uh, the Hancock lecture in 2018, and he referred to the rise in suspensions at school as an epidemic, noting that this lack of attachment to school is a major risk factor for offending. And this, work by Sullivan suggests that within 12 months, and this is Australian data now, this is not the US, within 12 months of being suspended, students are 50% more likely to be engaging in antisocial behavior, okay? So one thing that the New South Wales government is currently doing is revising its behavior management plan. Now this is not gonna be so easy because these are all outcomes targeting individual students and of course, we haven't discussed school outcomes or the outcomes for the classrooms or the peers or teachers or anything else, right? But it does seem to me to be a suggestion that we ought to be thinking about behavior management as one mechanism for breaking that tie. The other thing I wanna to point to is mentoring programs. So Heckman again argues for mentoring programs as a way forward. And in fact, um, there's this very nice German study that was conducted um, in Bonn where students were randomly allocated mentors and then they were evaluated. And those students who received a mentor were much more likely to enter the high academic track, okay? In Australia, the Victorian government does in fact provide um, grants to fund mentoring programs, but we don't yet know what the outcome of that is. The other thing I wanna mention is um, the Smith family. I mean, the Smith family has been engaged in essentially mentoring programs in schools for a very long time. And those programs provide financial support and they provide a, a coordinator. Um, the evidence of success is, you know, basically, um, seems kind of positive. It looks like outcomes for these kids are pretty good relative to similar sorts of peers, but there's been no formal evaluation of those programs. So we don't actually know what the impact is. So what works for disadvantaged students? It's actually pretty hard to know the answer to this question. I tried. I'm not an expert in this, but I tried. I called everybody I knew, and I know a lot of people, and nobody had answers for me. I had a lot of, we're starting to think about that, and maybe in five years we'll have the data that will give you the answer you need, but I didn't really get a very sensible answer. It's harder than you would expect to know this because when we think about what works in schools, we're not actually asking what works for disadvantaged students. So this, and I don't wanna pick on any particular government or report, but this is a recent report on what happens in schools. I went through the document, the word disadvantage appears five times. That five times is used to make two points. One is the government spends a lot of money on disadvantaged schools. And two, the research says we need to have high expectations for disadvantaged students. That's it, done. That's the sole takeaway from a report which is meant to tell us about what's working in schools. The second problem is that we don't innovate, evaluate and learn, okay? They're just insufficient data often. Um, 
and we don't really know what's effective at reducing disadvantage. So I just want to wrap up here and leave you with um, a couple of final thoughts. All right? Ultimately, um, any reduction in intergenerational disadvantage has to come because you've managed to reduce the persistence in socioeconomic position. And you have to have increase the opportunities for social and economic mobility. That's the, only, that's the only strategy for reducing intergenerational disadvantage. So this is the race that you have to somehow equalize. There is good news. This is a, a graph which, um, again, at OCD on the y-axis is reading scores on the, um, sorry, y-axis is reading scores. X-axis in the opposite direction is the um, extent to which social and economic disadvantage plays a role in education, okay? And the, the lines which determine the four quadrants is the OECD average. So countries that are in the top right quadrant, those are countries where test scores are above average and social and economic position pays less than average or smaller than average role in educational outcomes, okay? In the bottom left quadrant, these are countries where test scores are pretty bad and there's a lot of inequity associated with social and economic disadvantage. There's Australia. And there's the US. So good news, Australia is not like the US, right? You're starting, we're starting from a very, very strong position, right? We're starting from a very strong position. Test scores are higher than average. The impact of social and economic disadvantage is less than average, right? That's the good news. And, and the, but there are a number of countries that you might aspire to be. Right? Everyone wants to know about Finland, but the one that attracts me up there is Canada. Right? Surely we can be like Canada. That doesn't seem like a big step going forward. Um, and I think what I'll do is just leave it there. either here or online, although I can't see anybody online, so I'm gonna to have to rely on a bit of assistance. There is one question online, which I might just read out if that's okay. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by untargeted transfers to the poor? So untargeted transfers mean, um, you're just giving, you give money on the basis of family income without taking into account things like um, whether this is a single headed household or a couple headed household, whether there is a health issue, whether there is, you know, it's because somebody's unemployed, right? So Australia has quite a, um, a good social safety net in the sense that it's both broad, but it's targeted, right? So benefits are actually targeted towards individuals and families who don't have a lot of income, but also have these sorts of extra sources of, of disadvantage. Your, your point about uh, can we be like Canada um, resonates with me since I grew up in Canada and trying to think what's similar and what's different. And I guess one difference uh, that strikes me, not being an expert on it, is um, there's uh, massively more subsidies of private school education right. and single sex school education as well in Australia than in yeah. Canada. Um, does this play a role when you're saying that the sort of um, suspensions and 
those issues seem very correlated with the people then dropping out and, and that's really a key mechanism for um, problems later on. Um, is this related to just you know uh, st staff student ratios or things that are different in private schools and public schools or something else that's different with private schools and public schools or is it not related to private school public schools at all and I'm just worrying about the fact that inequality might be exaggerated by those policies. So so I guess I, I don't really know how suspensions and expulsions play out in private schools, right? I would be surprised if the, the kinds of numbers that you see in public schools were actually happening in private schools. Because after all, you know, parents pay a lot to make sure that private schools look after their kids. Um, but I think that your point about why does Australia look different to Canada yeah, it looks pretty different when you start thinking about the proportion of kids who are going through the private school sector. It's not so much the Catholic sector as it is the, the wealthy independent sector. Um, those schools are subsidized and, and the resources in those schools is just off the planet relative to what you would get in most public schools. So if you were thinking about uh, a structural part of the education system that you might think about addressing to kind of reduce this social and economic inequality, then I would think some way of thinking about the private public school mix is, is not a, um, it's not a bad place to start. Well. Sure. So, <clears throat> uh, my question is a bit uh, different um, because I focus on developing countries and we do see quite a bit of uh, evidence on the positive effect of unconditional cash transfer. Now, the question is, is there any way of thinking that um, some of them might be due to the over-insurance by the state or the government? Uh, some sort of moral hazard is happening there, coupled with information issue that they, don't, they can't see the future long enough beyond what they see, how their parents have been living. Yeah, so I think um, I wouldn't want to argue that unconditional cash transfers are not useful in developing countries. I think there's plenty of evidence that's true. Um, part of the reason that I think they're not the first thing you turn to in the developing, in the developed country context is the amount of money that you would need to actually give a family to sort of substantially improve their financial circumstances is, is pretty high. Um, and it very quickly becomes not kind of a, a, an option, really, to just think about piling a bunch of cash. Um, it seems to me that what's happening in families is more complicated than just the lack of financial resources. There's you know, low expectations, there's you know, information about what career possibilities are. Um, there seems to be just a lot of um, chaotic movement. You know, life is just much more chaotic. So, and, and again, I have, I have no evidence to necessarily back this up, but I think that if we were to tackle what I'm describing in Australia, we would tackle housing. We would tackle housing vulnerability because that it's that kind of churning through low income houses and you know, you're a low wage earner, you should be able to afford accommodation. And we know that families are under pressure. Those things are then tied to residential moves and school moves. So what I would be saying is let's, let's not think about you know, dumping a pile of cash. Let's see if we can do something about making housing more affordable and more stable for families who are vulnerable. When we're thinking about what works and what would be most efficient, in other words, what would have the greatest effect at the lowest cost to government or to society, what's the one piece of research that you'd like to see being done that would help us answer that question? Is it about housing, about the impact of housing change on education rates, for example? Um, it might be about housing. 
But um, my go-to for answering this, you know, what is the one thing you would do that doesn't cost the world? Um, and this is a bit of a simple suggestion, but what I would like to do is, um, you know, students, Australian kids receive student numbers when they enter school. And those student numbers don't transfer across states which I already think is, you know, a bit problematic. I would like to see those student numbers issued at birth. I would like to go into hospital rooms and say to parents, look, we believe education for your child begins at birth. Here's your kid's number. And I would like that kids to then be tracked as they access child and maternal health, childcare, preschool, et cetera. We have really good information about how Australian kids are doing when they enter kindergarten. Uh, we have good data once they hit schools. And this would give us an opportunity to start to say something about what's happening in these preschool years, which is a bit of a, you know, we don't see much unless things go very badly wrong and they come in contact with child protection services or hospitals, we don't know much. That would be, in my view, a very simple thing. Now I know it's you know, not uncontroversial. It starts to sound like a national identification number. You know, people have told me, you know, Australians had this debate and rolled it out. And then my response to that is, you know, I've been here 30 years. We haven't debated it since I've been here. And you know, if you ruled it out 30 years ago, maybe we could have another chat because it seems like that is something administrative we have great administrative data, we have good education data, and it would be a way to start kind of shining a light on what the, the early years experience is for kids. Hi, Deborah. We spoke about year, completing year 12 being a key determinant of a child's outcomes. And we spoke about some of the things that can be done, housing, mentors. But what would you say was the key thing which could actually manage that outcome? When, the, when could the intervention happen? So, so Heckman's response to this question is it has to be early, right? And if you read some of his stuff, he says, well, it's all over by the time they hit school. I just think that's not very helpful because you've got, you, you do have disadvantaged kids um, who are trundling their way through the school system and we can't just ignore that. I have, I have a strong preference for focusing also on adolescence. I actually think that the kind of middle years where they're in early primary school up until they leave primary school for high school I'm not gonna say they're all okay, but it's not terrible, right? They're in, they're in confined classrooms. Schools largely know where they are. They know what they're doing. They're interacting with parents. If you talk to teachers about where things go wrong for kids, it's often when they hit high school because they're moving around classrooms. They lose the, the context. Adolescents start to make all kinds of decisions, some of which are quite, um, I mean, they, you know, they're life altering some of these decisions that they make. And I would be focused on that as a pretty important age group. And I do think that these programs, which mentoring, you know, providing advice, careers advice, helping students negotiate things um, when their families may not be in a position to provide them with that, you know, that's, that's something that doesn't have to necessarily cost the world. You can you know, bring in community organizations. And in fact, there are a lot of very fine community-based organizations that do a lot of really good work in that regard. Yes. <laughs> Please join me again in thanking Deborah for that fantastic. I'd like to uh, briefly thank uh, Tiffany, Talia, and the rest of the events team who, who made uh, tonight possible.
uh, to the University of Sydney and the head of school, Professor Gary Barrett, for your hospitality. We really appreciate it. Um, I have very fond memories of the University of Sydney, which is my alma mater and gave me a start in taking my first economics course. So you're both responsible for that, but also have my gratitude. Um, and I believe uh, we're going to be able to enjoy some more of the University of Sydney's hospitality as you join us for refreshments outside. Thank you again, Deborah.